Hello, everybody. You're very welcome to uh, the International Transport Forum's Ask the Author session on developing strategic approaches to infrastructure planning. Um, while attendees are still arriving, a few housekeeping rules. To send us your questions, please use the Q&A function that you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screens. Uh, we, we're not able to see any chat functions, unfortunately, so you can put your questions into the Q&A 30-minute session. We'll present. So the, um, the report's lead author, Rex Dayton-Smith, will bring us through the main findings uh, of the report, which is on uh, strategic infrastructure planning. Uh, very topical uh, in the week where the USA, for example, is considering a $1.9 trillion stimulus package, one of the biggest in its history. We'll take you through our findings on uh, infrastructure, which of course underpins national economies and uh, wider quality of life. So I'll pass the floor over to, to Rex and um, don't hesitate to put your questions in as of now. Over to Rex. Well, thanks, Ronan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us for today's session. Uh, this report, which was published by ITF last month, is the uh, product of a working group which comprised 38 members from 12 of our ITF member countries, as well as several international organisations. Uh, it was chaired by Phil Graham, who until quite recently was the Chief Executive of the UK's National Infrastructure Commission. Uh, the working group met uh, four times between March 2019 and June 2020. And we had 11 working group members uh, contributing to the drafting of the report, uh, whom I'd like to thank. The report uh, looks at a number of issues in connection with strategic infrastructure planning. Uh, firstly, it looks at current and emerging practices in terms of project identification, appraisal and selection. It then goes through a number of key uh, institutional and process issues. Uh, before proceeding to a chapter that looks at broadening the scope of infrastructure appraisal, uh, particularly considering the role of uh, wider economic benefits analysis, considerations of equity and of sustainability. Uh, it focuses on the use of ex post performance measurement uh, and how uh, good practices in ex post evaluation can feed back into improved project appraisal and then concludes with a number of recommendations. So the report's discussion of project identification, appraisal and selection was based on survey work undertaken by members of the working group. Uh, it finds that uh, project identification is based and, and appraisal are based on some form of strategic plan in most, although not all of the surveyed countries. However, most of these plans are partial in nature. They are either based on single sectors or they're regional in their focus. And the use of multi-sectoral plans is currently rare. In terms of institutional responsibilities, we see that national transport agencies, which increasingly are typically quasi-independent, are taking the lead roles in, in terms of project identification and also appraisal. Uh, that said, there is a degree of decentralization of the project identification function, particularly in uh, federal countries. Project identification and selection are largely separate. Uh, and this is a function of the fact that the latter role is typically undertaken at the political level, whereas the former is essentially an administrative function. Uh, in terms of selection criteria, the project selection is very much uh, driven by the question of how consistent with the strategic plan in, a, in operation a particular project is judged to be. Formal cost benefit analysis is a core methodology in virtually all of the countries uh, surveyed, but the uh, degree of primacy that it's given uh, tends to vary quite significantly from country to country. And so it is not necessarily the predominant methodology used. Most, uh, but not quite all countries also have an independent quality control function so that 
uh, project uh, appraisal is typically undertaken by the sponsoring agency, uh, but then subject to quality control by some other independent entity. So to inst institutional and process issues, uh, one of the key issues addressed is an investigation of an apparent trend toward the establishment of independent infrastructure advisory bodies. Now this, I think we would describe as something of a nascent trend, but uh, we've identified quite a number of these bodies uh, as having been established over approximately the last decade. Uh, in Australia, the federal government and uh, all six state governments have established such bodies. Uh, they exist in the United Kingdom uh, and also in the devolved governments of Scotland and Wales and also in New Zealand. Uh, now, a key feature of these bodies is that they have multi-sectoral remits, typically covering virtually all physical infrastructure sectors. And so they can be distinguished between other bodies such as France's Immobilité 21, which is sector specific uh, in, its, in its focus and remit. The core role of these bodies is to provide advice on needs, uh, infrastructure needs and strategic priorities. Some of them also have a, undertake project appraisal functions. Uh, in Australia's uh, federal body, for example, it is the, uh, the main driver of the independent assessments of uh, project appraisals that are undertaken. The underlying reason for establishing these bodies is that they're intended to enhance the uh, rigor of uh, infrastructure planning processes, their transparency, and their strategic focus, uh, as well as uh, in all of those ways, contributing to consistency of the projects that are chosen with the objectives of strategic plans that are in place. The second institutional process issue covered is that of stewardship of existing assets. And this was identified by the working group as a key area for improving current practice. Uh, it's essential to, to have conscious and, and uh, stewardship of existing assets to ensure that availability and performance are maximized and that the life cycle cost of infrastructure assets is minimized, particularly through ensuring optimal maintenance scheduling. To achieve this better stewardship requires allocation of clear responsibilities uh, with clear financial accountability as part of that and there is considerable room for the application of regulatory disciplines uh, as part of the process. Uh, another significant aspect of this is the need for strategic choices to be undertaken between allocating funding to new uh, infrastructure investments and to maintenance and upgrade programs for existing assets. At the uh, same time as the publication of this report, a companion paper was also produced, which addresses the issue of temporal issues in strategic infrastructure planning. Uh, I won't speak very much about it, but just note that it a number, had a number of key recommendations, including the use of scenario analysis in developing strategic plans, ensuring that discount rates are appropriately set. And that requires, in many cases, uh, reviewing the conceptual basis for those discount rates and resetting them appropriately. Uh, it recommends a greater use of user charging and pricing in order to manage the demand for infrastructure assets, particularly in a context of uh, budget constraints on provision of new infrastructure. Uh, it recommends investment in more data collection and analysis in order to better enable governments to set priorities appropriately and also more investment in feasibility studies to ensure that in a context, uh, as uh, Ronan mentioned, of uh, a requirement for timely uh, stimulus spending to be undertaken, that good quality infrastructure projects uh, have been identified and are able to be undertaken uh, within reasonable uh, timeframes that achieve the stimulus objectives. Finally, it suggests that uh, governments should develop guidelines uh, to encourage a stable level of infrastructure spending uh, to be undertaken in the medium term, uh, thus increasing the transparency and predictability of infrastructure programs 
and providing certainty for the industries that are undertaking the actual construction and operation. Uh, moving to broadening the scope of uh, project appraisal. Uh, the fundamental point here is that uh, cost benefit analysis remains of central importance. We see that uh, as part of, of the evolution of cost benefit analysis practice, there is a clear trend toward broadening its scope, uh, particularly through the use of indirect valuation techniques. Uh, for example, in looking at impacts on non-users, uh, such as pollution and noise effects. Uh, regional and social equity considerations are also obviously increasingly relevant in the infrastructure uh, area. And this necessarily requires complementary analysis, such as accessibility analysis, as benefit cost analysis is not well equipped to answer distributional questions. Uh, and in this context, I'd just like to note an uh, upcoming ITF roundtable which will look at the question of broadening appraisal to capture the full impacts of investment uh, decisions. Uh, that'll be undertaken on September 30th and October the 1st this year in Paris. The issue of the use of wider economic benefits assessment is uh, one of the key topics in the report. Uh, and it is concluded that they should be, this, this kind of analysis should be included in the case of larger transformative projects. In most cases, uh, estimates of the size of these wider benefits are relatively limited. But for some particularly for, uh, large and transformative projects, for example, the Grand Paris Express, uh, this is, uh, the, the size of these benefits is much greater and is a key driver uh, of the business case for potential investments. That said, uh, Research shows that estimates of the size uh, of these benefits are subject to uh, much uncertainty. Uh, and one of the drivers that is, is questions over whether they will actually be delivered in practice. So the issue of scenario analysis becomes quite important. And many guidelines uh, suggest that the core uh, cost benefit analysis and the wider economic impacts analysis should be presented separately uh, in order to better inform decision makers. Obviously, the wider economic impacts analysis adds a macroeconomic perspective where benefit cost analysis is microeconomic in, in basis. Uh, the key impacts that it's looking at are on productivity, uh, labor supply, and uh, investment. And the focus is on estimating impacts on aggregate output and employment, which uh, can occur if the investment has the uh, ability to affect to reduce existing market uh, infections. We also include uh, two case studies, uh, which are in some ways quite contrasting, uh, on uh, cross border infrastructure planning. One of these looks at the Danube River region, uh, region and the other, the uh, Oresund Bridge uh, between Denmark and Sweden. Uh, these case studies tend to highlight the fact that there can be major benefits uh, arising from effective interregional or international uh, cooperation on infrastructure provision and management. But at the same time, the challenges uh, can be very substantial, particularly where you have large numbers of countries involved, where they have uh, quite significantly different economic cir circumstances, and uh, on occasion where there are important uh, historical differences uh, and tensions between them. In light of this, uh, the report emphasizes the importance of focusing on having formally agreed arrangements to drive the cooperation, uh, in particular, establishing specific purpose management bodies, having clearly identified objectives and performance standards, and an agreed allocation of responsibilities. Uh, moving to ex post assessment, uh, core observation here is that in most countries, relatively few major infrastructure projects are subject to ex post evaluation. Uh, this is a key issue because such evaluations enable project issues to be identified and addressed if they're commenced relatively early in the process. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, evaluation is a powerful tool for improving ex-ante project appraisals. 
and in doing so in maintaining confidence uh, in those appraisals and therefore in the project selection processes. Uh, there are obviously significant challenges, however, in undertaking such uh, evaluations. Uh, these include timing, uh, where you have, as is inevitably the case, very long project lifespans, the question of when evaluation should be uh, undertaken and how frequently arises. Uh, there are important methodological challenges to be addressed, including identifying causality uh, and the appropriate counterfactuals. Uh, data collection is a significant uh, issue, uh, as is the need for consistent performance measures. So to finish uh, with the key recommendations of the report, we recommend that governments should adopt detailed strategic infrastructure plans, which cover all major physical infrastructure sectors that are explicitly linked to funding envelopes in order to ensure their realism and practicality and which address all feasible scenarios. Institutional and governance arrangements are crucial and governments in this context should consider establishing independent advisory bodies to provide transparent and expert advice. Uh, in doing so, they should ensure that the governance principles that are applied to these bodies reflect the OECD's principles on the governance of regulators. Project appraisal should be based on a consistent methodology, which is broad enough to capture all significant impacts uh, of projects. Uh, an expanded cost-benefit analysis should be at the core, as this helps to promote an integrated analysis. And wider economic impact analysis should be used selectively for the largest uh, projects. Governments should also adopt a formal policy on the stewardship of major infrastructure assets and should require ex post assessments to be carried out for all major infrastructure projects. And finally, they should develop a consistent set of infrastructure performance measures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rex, for a very succinct overview of, uh, of a very complex next topic and a very uh, in-depth report. So uh, send us your questions in using the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, a few questions already coming in, so please don't hesitate um, to, to uh, highlight any aspect of the report that you'd like uh, Rex to, to comment on to take your questions. So to get the ball rolling, first question, Rex. Um, you mentioned um, the, um, the use of independent uh, infrastructure advisory bodies. Um, the question is, how strong is the actual evidence for the benefit of such organizations? Thanks, Ronan. Uh, yes, I think I described the trend as, as being a nascent one. Uh, we were struck by the fact that, uh, as was perhaps apparent in my uh, presentation, there seemed to be a sort of a strong uh, orientation toward the, the uh, Anglophone countries in terms of who was establishing these. Uh, their track records are fairly short at this stage, uh, but I think that it, it, it's fair to say that they have uh, made significant contributions in terms of, uh, I guess, opening the discussion, uh, helping to reduce the, the level of, I guess, uh, political impact in this space. They have typically relatively small budgets and they appear to be quite a cost effective uh, mechanism, which uh, because of that is, is one that can quite pragmatically uh, be considered uh, by smaller and less well resourced countries as well as larger ones. So uh, whilst I think there's, there's limited uh, research that to, uh, I guess, really clearly establish uh, the size of their impact, we'd say that um, the uh, indications at this relatively early stage in their use are, are strongly positive. Okay, thanks, Rex. Um, of the uh, questions coming in, um, an interesting question for from Lorenzo Katsuro, who we know very well, of course, XITF and currently with, uh, with uh, OECD who's asking um, about the experience of the recently set up uh, Canada in Infrastructure Bank and the relationships between such green banks and national infrastructure banks 
and the strategic planning and planning authorities. Um, would you like to comment on uh, on that setup? Uh, I'm afraid I'm not uh, not very um, well versed in that one, so I might have to take that uh, question on notice uh, and get back to uh, Lorenzo. I think. Sorry about that. Okay, no problem. And we do, of course, endeavour to get back to any questions that that you send in, either during the session or, of course, uh, after the session, directly with you in writing. Um, question in. Um, you mentioned that the multi-sectoral strategic infrastructure plans are quite rare. Can you enlighten us as to the key benefits of such plans? Yeah, uh, essentially uh, the, the process of, of project selection is about looking at uh, competing options for spending uh, obviously limited uh, amounts of funding. Uh, if we do that within a sector, we, we reap a certain amount of efficiency gain but if we can uh, seek to compare across sectors, and, and you know, a caveat here is that there are some significant uh, difficulties in conducting those cross-sectoral uh, comparisons. But I think uh, broadly speaking, we can say that uh, it is something that is possible to do, uh, albeit carefully, and that to the extent that we can do that, uh, a, a cross-sectoral plan uh, encourages that sort of practice and is likely to maximize the size uh, of those efficiency gains we get through systematically improving uh, project selection and, uh, and helping to maximize uh, the productivity of our infrastructure investments. Okay, thanks. Um, a question in from Michel Savi. Uh, on uh, financing, uh, Michelle asks, should not selected projects be stabilized through a multi-annual financing, sh financing uh, schedule inside a dedicated planning law voted by the parliament so as to reduce the short-term uh, budget adjustments? Yeah, I think uh, this, this is an area that is of, of significant importance and some other uh, ITF work uh, on infrastructure uh, has addressed these issues of, of project funding and financing in a fair bit of detail, uh, partly as a result of that, that's something that uh, this infrastructure report uh, doesn't address. Um, but I would uh, I'd certainly suggest uh, reviewing the ITF website for uh, previous publications on this issue. Uh, and I, I would generally agree with uh, the broad tenor of the question that uh, these uh, questions of how we fund and how we finance infrastructure uh, are really fundamental to the uh, quality of the outcomes that we get through our infrastructure investment program. Okay, uh, also on the financing side, a question from Pierpaolo Casola, who uh, is our ITF colleague, um, uh, on how important you think uh, COVID-19 and the subsequent momentum to use debt-driven public spending uh, in the, the Build Back Better movement will have decisions on infrastructure. Yeah, look, I, I think uh, there's, there's been a lot of discussion over uh, a significant period about the, uh, the idea of there being a, an infrastructure lag. Uh, and I think we've had indications from uh, quite a number of governments. Obviously, you mentioned uh, the US, but I think we, we're seeing it uh, across many of the OECD member country governments that there is uh, an intention in the name of, uh, of uh, ensuring a rapid and sustained recovery from COVID uh, to bring forward a lot of infrastructure planning. There are other trends obviously that are feeding into this in terms of uh, long-term availability of, of uh, low-cost financing for governments uh, and I guess changes also in terms of monetary policy and attitudes to, to public sector debt which are all likely to encourage this trend. So I think uh, it's, uh, it's likely to be one that's quite significant over time. Okay, thank you. Um, we'd like to run a very quick poll with our users. This is to check that we are uh, providing you a product which you find uh, useful and interesting. So Andre, you can, you can run the poll now if you wouldn't mind replying quickly to, uh, to, to uh, two quick questions. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question uh, in from Frank Gajust, who uh, thanks, thanks us for uh, a very interesting report, um, has a question on stewardship. Uh, did you find experience with multi-annual infrastructure contracts that they have been compulsory, for example, in the rail sector uh, in EU member states? 
Sorry, I, I didn't quite catch the question, right? The, the question is regarding stewardship and uh, your experience with multi-annual infrastructure contracts. The example being that the fact they've been compulsory in the rail sector within uh, the EU. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I'm sorry again. Uh, the, this is not an area that we've delved into in, in a great deal of detail. I think the report really looks uh, at this issue from the from the point of view of principle uh, and uh, argues for the allocation, as as some of our previous uh, ITF work has, uh, for the allocation of clear responsibilities. Um, obviously, a, a, an appropriate time frame is necessary in order to ensure that the incentive uh, impacts uh, uh, favour the efficiency objectives that underlie this process. So we would uh, we would clearly be expecting this to be. Uh, something that will be undertaken on a long-term uh, multi-annual basis. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, interesting question from uh, Michel Delmar. Uh, has there be any? Has there been any attempt to complement CBAs with an assessment of financial return to the state, which may be positive uh, in uh, in the longer term? He's referring to the IMF's World Economic Outlook 2014, which which made that uh, comment. Yeah, uh, not an area that was uh, was covered in this uh, report. Um, I guess broadly, we would say that the uh, the perspective that's taken is one about maximising uh, societal returns. Uh, and uh, whilst on the one hand, government uh, obviously has to have regard to its budgetary position, uh, you know, this these uh, questions of uh, uh, the productivity of the infrastructure expenditure, uh, we would say, were, were fundamental and that the issues of financing and, and funding, which uh, you know, then underlie that, that question of impact on government budgets, uh, would, would be, the, if you like, the, the second level questions. Okay, thank you. We still have time for a few more questions, so don't hesitate. Um, one on uh, evaluation. Um, you mentioned um, ex post evaluation as being a good way to contribute to uh, to ex ante project appraisal. You mentioned confidence. Can you explain on the main ways in which uh, ex post evaluation is useful? Yeah. Look, uh, one uh, key dynamic I think that's been identified is that uh, quite a lot of research suggests that. Uh, there's an important level of optimism bias in ex ante project appraisal. Uh, you might, uh, I guess, point to the fact that these appraisals are in the first instance, uh, as I was saying, undertaken by project proponents, notwithstanding that they're subject to uh, independent um, quality assurance processes in, in most countries. Uh, it's perhaps unsurprising that proponent agencies are prone to a little optimism bias. Uh, the systematic uh, application of ex post evaluation gives rise to the potential uh, to identify and address the causes of the, some of those uh, ex ante biases uh, and to uh, enable government to develop improved ex ante appraisal guidelines, uh, which can help to try and address those and so reduce uh, their importance and contribute to more accurate and more reliable uh, ex ante project appraisals. Okay, thanks. Um, a question from Jan Frank, uh, I suspect linked to the, the perennial issue of electoral cycles, etc. cetera. Uh, Jan asks, so what, what do you suggest as a strategic approach to get more attention and money for maintenance of infrastructure, given that investment in new infrastructure is often seen as more interesting by policymakers and politicians? Yes, I, I, I think that's certainly an important dynamic. Uh, and. Uh, the report suggests that this is in fact one of the potential benefits of the uh, trend to adopting uh, independent infrastructure advisory bodies. Uh, as I mentioned, one of their uh, perhaps, perhaps the most uh, common uh, and, and most central role that they uh, undertake is to identify infrastructure needs and priorities. Uh, the fact that they're able to do that in an in a independent uh, sort of dispassionate way and in a very transparent way. Uh, typically, these organisations publish uh, every year or every two years uh, an updated version of this list of priorities with their recommendations. 
that provides uh, something that uh, is very concrete and feeds into public discussion. Uh, and in that way, to the extent that uh, that dynamic is identified, to the extent that uh, through that process, the importance of uh, appropriate maintenance and upgrade scheduling uh, and, and uh, allocating sufficient expenditure to those functions is identified, it makes it more difficult, uh, I guess, for uh, more political decisions in favour of uh, new infrastructure uh, projects uh, to be favoured uh, more than efficiency would suggest. Okay. Um, we're, we're nearing the end of our session, however, still interesting questions coming through. Um, it's very topical um, from Pier Paolo Cazzola again, uh, as a follow up to the, the build back better uh, dynamic. He asks, do you see any specific case as likely to be more stimulated than others? And he gives four examples of, uh, of investment types. One would be in, to invest in modal shifts, others in um, integrating new mobility services and the role of public transport. Third one would be uh, to enable the transition to low carbon vehicles. And fourth and finally, investment in di digital infrastructure for uh, effective road user charges, for example. Do we see evidence of that in the Build, build Back Better movement? Look, I, I think we will see um, a bit of tension uh, here. In part, uh, I, I mentioned the importance of timeliness to in a context in which our intentions with, a, with an expanded infrastructure program are uh, stimulatory in nature. And you know, one, of the, one of the obvious uh, conclusions to draw from that is that it makes sense to favor uh, maintenance and upgrade expenditure because uh, the funds can, can, be, uh, can be expended uh, in a more timely fashion. Uh, the stimulus uh, gets out there into the economy uh, as required. But beyond that, um, you know, Pierre's uh, pointed to a couple of uh, very important medium to uh, term, uh, medium to long term, even uh, priorities, uh, particularly in relation to modal shift. Uh, and I think government's going to be looking uh, at those uh, and, and at this uh, uh, broad stimulus uh, context as being a way that they can make uh, a bit of a step change in some, some rapid project, uh, sorry, pro progress. Uh, in those areas. Okay, interesting. Um, um, very good question in from Mircea Tenovic. Um, are you aware of significant sectoral differences in ex ante optimism bias between sectors? And are rail projects more prone to such a bias? Uh, I'm not aware of, uh, of any such breakdown in terms of those broad conclusions of the literature. Uh, I think it's, it would be a very interesting question. Uh, my sense is that uh, it's, the research is per perhaps not as, as granular as would allow us to make draw firm uh, conclusions, but uh, it's, uh, it's a little further into the subject than uh, we've been able to go so far. Really. Okay, um, and I think we'll, we'll need to wrap it up um, with with one last question again from Piero Paolo Casola. Um, he wonders: Are there stranded asset risks posed to infrastructure transport infrastructure by shifts in reliance to different modes due to climate policy? And do you see this as something that would influence the decision of investors? I think that uh, we're seeing uh, people increasingly concerned in a, in a whole range of areas about stranded asset risks, uh, in part because of the, the patterns of our response uh, to the climate change imperative, which uh, has been, uh, you know, as, as is increasingly recognised, uh, slower than it ought to have been for a long period. And as a result, uh, we, we're expecting some quite rapid shifts. And whenever you have very rapid shifts in policy, uh, with uh, obviously uh, investment implications, uh, that risk of stranded assets is, uh, is increased. And uh, I think given that our major uh, transport infrastructure uh, assets have very long lifespans, then uh, clearly this is a, a significant uh, risk and one which, to which we need to pay uh, a great deal of attention. And uh, I guess that leads us back to the benefits of independent infrastructure advisory bodies in terms of trying to encourage and 
and require governments to take a, a longer term perspective when they're making these sorts of large, uh, large scale infrastructure investment decisions. Okay, thank you very much, Rex. Um, well, I think we need to wrap it up there. Just to let you know, you have uh, the link to the full report is in the chat. Um, feel free to download it and digest it if you haven't already. Uh, any questions we weren't able to answer uh, during this short format, we will get back to you uh, directly via email. So our huge thanks to, to Rex Dayton Smith, the lead author of the report, and for your participation and your excellent questions. And uh, tomorrow we will be back with Ask the Author at uh, 2 p.m. Paris time, looking at drones and their integration into the transport system. Thank you all very much. Thank you.